and to do with the uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit, there's a lot of me. Okay, um, <laughs> thank you very much everyone for um, coming to our seminar today. Uh, I'm delighted to um, introduce uh, Tom Irving, who has been working uh, most recently as a modeler for um, the Department of Health as part of SPY-M. Uh, I think a lot of us, when we're doing epidemiology, it's a bit, um, it's maybe a bit ambiguous how you get from the work that we're doing to, uh, you know, helping people and improving people's health. Um, I think the work that uh, Tom and Alan have been doing over the um, pandemic has been um, truly remarkable, and it's um, a fantastic um, illustration of the benefits of um, epidemiology or what we can do with it. Um, so, yeah, I think Tom's going to give you a bit of an overview of where he comes from, and um, which is not this building, but Canning Hall. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I will hand over to Tom first, and then Alan's going to be second. Um, I will put our share the PowerPoint, and you should be able to take it away. Cool. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I find it useful to start off with the thanks rather than having it at the end so it doesn't get lost. So thank you first for having me. Um, thank you secondly to Ellen and everyone else on SPYM for doing all this hard work that I get the credit for. Uh, Neil called me a mod, said that I'm a modeler, but I'm just a, uh, a user of modeling, really, rather than anything else. Um, and thank you, thank you also to my team, especially uh, Libby Richards, who co-runs the team with me and without whom I do not know what we would have done. So just briefly to say a little bit about how we work. So I look after SPYM, which in true epidemiolog epidemiological style is a horrible, tortuous acronym. Um, I can never even remember what it stands for, but it says it on there. Um, so we are a subgroup of SAGE responsible for infectious disease modelling and then we report into, or SAGE report into ministers via the cabinet office. So um, predominantly these four, these, these were known as the quad, um, one of them's moved, Sean, I'll let you guess which one there is isn't there anymore. Um, so yeah, just yeah, we are a subgroup of SAGE, we don't report to ministers ourselves. So the first thing you think, looking at this, I'm sure is, these can't be epidemiologists. They're all wearing ties and dresses, um, but they are. They were, this is us, us at Oxford a couple of months ago. Um, and the second thing you might think is that there are quite a lot of them. And this really speaks to the founding principle that we have, which is to have a real diversity of, um, of work that comes to us. So for any major piece of work, we always like to have at the very least two or three independent models working on the same problem. And this is really quite a, it's been really important for how things have gone for the last couple of years. So there've been some times where um, model results are quite counterintuitive. And when you have two or three results from different groups saying the same thing, that gives you a lot more confidence that what you have come out with is correct. But on the other hand, it's even more useful when models say different things, because to my mind, the most important things that models can do for policy is really pick out what the differences are, pick out what the sensitivities are, what the important parameters are. And once you know what that is, you know what the most important things are that um, the important levers that policymakers have. Um, what are the things that will control what will happen over the next few months. So in terms of what we do, I tend to think of it in three buckets. So what now, what next, and what if. So starting with what now. At the very start of the pandemic, a lot of what we were doing is estimating the really fundamental parameters. So things like the infection fatality rate, the infection hospitalization rate, um, doubling times all that sort of thing that we really take for granted now. But at the time we were wading through a fog trying to uh, pick out anything we could to tell us what was gonna be hitting us. 
then throughout the pandemic, all the way up to July, we were responsible for estimating the R number each week and the growth rate. So this is just an illustration of how we um, did that. So the 11 coloured bars here are 11 estimates from independent models from different groups. Um, and you can see that week, some people thought the epidemic was slightly shrinking. Some people thought it was slightly growing. Then the far right of that image is the statistical combination of those results. And that straddles one. We published that week estimating 0.9 to 1.1. And had we just picked one of these models, we could have given a false sense of certainty. Um, and had you picked the third one across, it wouldn't have told you very much at all because it has such a wide range. So by combining model results, you get much more robust, much more powerful answer. Next up, um, this is an example of what we call medium term projections. So again, this is something we've run every week um, since, well, since very early on. And all this is saying is if things continue the way they are now, so no policy changes, no behavioral changes, then what is going to happen next? And this particular one is from the end of October last year um, and got a fair amount of attention, it's fair to say, because it became apparent to people at the top that if we continued where we were going, then we would get in trouble quite quickly. So three weeks after, well, we went into lockdown very shortly after this. Um, three weeks later, we had 1,700 hospital admissions in England. So I should have said this is hospital admissions in England. Three weeks later, we had 1,700 of them, which was pretty much bang on our median. But then, of course, after that, this becomes completely useless because um, policies are changed, behaviours are changed. So, of course, we weren't going to continue along on that trajectory. So these were really useful in times of stability and really useless at turning points. So that brings us to the third prong, which I'm calling what if. So probably most of what has gotten attention from SPIM is modeling of particular scenarios um, relating to potential future policies. And it's really important, first of all, to think what this isn't and what we can't do. So ministers and policymakers and everyone you know in the country would love a crystal ball and sadly we don't have one of those we can't tell people exactly what's going to happen we cannot precisely predict behavior we um, can't model micro behaviors so we got often asked what would the effect be of opening nail bars and you know i don't have much experience with nail bars but we can't go down to that granularity. No one can go down to that kind of granularity. Um, I have to do a lot of saying no to people. And finally, it's also just worth remembering that we aren't economists. We are experts in the non-COVID harms that come from other interventions. We aren't the ones to put those pieces of the jigsaw together. They happen elsewhere in government. So I thought I might just, um, oh, sorry, but what this can do is this can give you a sense of um, the sort of scale of um, worst and best cases for coming months. It can give you important policy insights and it can tell you, as I mentioned earlier, what the key uncertainties are and therefore the um, things that ministers should be working on. So I thought I might just illustrate this with an example. Hopefully you all remember um, that back in February, the government published what they called a roadmap. So this was the way that we would gradually remove restrictions, um, um, leaving lockdown to a point where you have um, yeah, no legal restrictions as you do now. And that was something that the modelers had a lot of work feeding into. Um, Ooh, I was hoping this would come up as 10 different slides. You have to imagine you can only see number one on there and just pretend the other ones aren't on there. Um, so I said I didn't have a crystal ball, but the first thing I have to do is to pretend I have a crystal ball. Um, so pretty much exactly a year ago, uh, we'd just gone into lockdown. 
and we were a couple of weeks away from getting the first um, positive results from a vaccine trial. And we were under quite a lot of pressure to come up with short-term modelling saying what was going to happen next. But it seemed to me that it was really important that we got ahead of the game when it came to vaccinations. It was likely that vaccines would be coming up sooner rather than later and there would be a huge amount of policy thinking to go around that. And there simply isn't enough time in COVID world to react to most questions that ministers and policymakers have. You need to get ahead of the game to be able to um, uh, get the scientific basis for your decisions. And, you know, putting vaccines into models, that's a significant piece of work. <coughs> so first task is to work out what I'm going to be asked in three weeks, three months time. Um, secondly, I need to translate that from policy talk into something that modelers can do, um, which, which um, can be quite a tricky task. Secondly, uh, thirdly, I do nothing. So thirdly, I give these guys the time and space to do their work. And a lot of that involves me having to say no to people. So this is quite hard because um, you come under a lot of pressure to do things, especially when there's a minister at the top wanting it done. Um, but even these guys have limited capacity and you need to be able to prioritize things that are most useful. And as I mentioned earlier, you need to say no to things that cannot realistically, scientifically be modeled like opening nail bars. So my guys will go away, do some modeling. I'll hopefully get three long papers summarizing all their work. Then my next task is to pick out the policy relevant conclusions from those. And when it came to that, well, so, so normally, you know, it's probably only like three or four bullet points, which are the key things I'm going to pick out of you know 70 pages worth of analysis. So with the very first set of modeling on vaccines which came to us at the start of December, there are really four conclusions. So firstly that it was really unlikely that vaccines themselves with nothing else would be able to get us to herd immunity and that therefore there's a policy to prepare for another exit wave as you lift restrictions. Secondly, that at the time there was a lot of thinking that you know we need to uptake vaccines to like 75 80 percent, which is what we tend to aim for for adult vaccine programs. <coughs> and this showed that that will be nowhere near enough, that you need to be getting well into the 90s for uptake in older people to prevent a huge number of hospital admissions and deaths happening after you lifted restrictions. Thirdly, if you were to lift restrictions in you know, a step-by-step -step manner, as was almost certainly going to be the case, what would happen would be critically dependent on behaviour and how effective the vaccines were against transmission. And you could never predict the first one precisely. And the second one, there was no information at the time, this was December, and we knew it would take several months for the results of that kind of study to come through. So the policy conclusion from that was that you need to rely on data not on dates you shouldn't have a fixed time scale for leaving restrictions and finally all the work we did pointed to the fact that keeping some kind of baseline measures in place would make a massive difference to the um, long-term outcomes and when i say measures you know that that was policy agnostic so it could just be keeping testing going it could be just um, no rules in place but encouraging people to behave responsibly or it could be things like wearing face masks and so you say that was December and in retrospect I think all those things seem really obvious but at the time they weren't and certainly we were quite surprised how high you need to get older people's vaccination stats up to avoid getting into a sticky situation um, but looking back I think all of those really um, uh, held up and those were the founding principles of the roadmap that was announced in February. So once we had those results um, we then had to translate it into policy talk so that's an entirely different language to English which is entirely different language to modelling um, and then 
I said here, number seven, spread the word. So after Sage, um, we had to make sure the system understands the results and believes the results. And you'd be shocked to hear that within a bureaucracy, information doesn't just free flow uh, as it's meant to. So a lot of our work after that was making sure the right people knew about it and the right people understood it. Um, second to last, I said rinse and repeat. So um, we did a lot of iterations of these work. It isn't just a one-way conversation. Once your policymakers see it, take it, understand it, um, speak to ministers, then we had to iterate and run a bunch of different potential roadmap um, scenarios. Um, which leads us nicely on to number nine. So all of the key documents that we do um, get published normally within a couple of weeks. And that is a really, really important part of the process. Um, it means that when we are writing these summary documents, we aren't just aiming them at policymakers, we're also aiming them at the scientists, aiming them at ministers and aiming it at Joe Blogs. And um, it turns out that actually there's a lot of demand for this work. So um, at least one of our papers has had something like 150,000 downloads, which I think is pretty crazy for, you know, science. Um, but yeah, you have to be really careful to make sure everything is, take, is understandable, not taken out of context. But once you do publish it, we have to deal with a lot of the fallout. So press, comments, um, all those you know bits of democracy you know like when ministers ask you questions in parliament or you know freedom of information requests uh, which take up a lot of time but is important um to do so yeah my job is partly just organizing meetings but really there's a heck of a lot more that goes on um behind the scenes um but we couldn't do any of that unless we actually had people like ellen doing the work so she'll hand over to her Great. So, um, hi everyone, and thanks Tom for asking me to um, contribute to his talk. Um, so, I was just going to talk about um, how I got involved in SPIM and generally uh, um, the experience of being a modeler um, as part of SPIM. So, before, before the pandemic, um, I worked on infectious diseases. So, generally, most of the people you saw in Tom's picture they're infectious disease modelers who've been working on infectious diseases for years, if not decades. Um, I did my PhD on the role of cattle movement spreading bovine TB. And just immediately before the pandemic, uh, I was looking at the spread of TB in the UK, uh, which now everyone knows what the R number is. Uh, the reproduction number is about 0 0.4 uh, in the UK. So obviously mostly under control. Um, and this is and also looking at different scenarios on the type of thing that Tom was talking about, the kind of what if scenarios, but for in other infectious diseases like that one's for hepatitis A and how you should control it within schools. Um, so back in February 2020, Leon, who's over there, uh, who I'm also married to, suggested that we should repurpose one of uh, the model that we'd already done for flu and look at COVID instead. And um, one thing that I found quite strange about this period of time uh, back at the beginning of 2020 is no one really asked us to do it. In fact, I suggested to someone that we should do it and they said, oh no, don't worry. There's loads of other modelers working on COVID. Do something else instead. But nevertheless, we did it. We did it anyway. And this was one of our first pictures. And one of the I mean, because having lots of independent groups is good for lots of reasons, but you always inevitably do things a little bit differently from other people. So in this particular model, we had seasonality where other people didn't. And um, we came up with these number of different epidemic curves, depending on the level of se uh, seasonality that there might, might be. Um, associated with COVID transmission. Of course, at the time, we had no idea what might be driving the seasonality. That could be anything from restrictions to, tra uh, to just poorer transmission or everyone being outdoors. But um, you can see that at the time in February 2020, we obviously had no way of distinguishing between 
any, the, any number of different outcomes that um, that might that might happen. Um, so this, I mean, people are still working on this model that we did then, but really the good thing about this model for us is it meant that we got invited along to a SPIM meeting. Um, so we first, well, first Leon went along to a meeting and then I think I got, he couldn't go to one, so I went to the next one. And we started using this model as one of the models that was contributing to um, the multiple models that were predicting the potential impact of COVID in the UK in the absence of any interventions. So it was we, uh, what this was one of the models that was being compared against the imperial, uh, the imperial model, for example. Um, so once once I was at the spy and meetings, then all of a sudden there are obviously lots of other questions that come up. And in particular, in March, a lot of people were talking about whether these whether large events should be cancelled. So there was the Cheltenham Festival and um, in you know, on the 12th of March, um, Nicola Sturgeon announced that large gatherings would be cancelled. Uh, and then a day, a day later, Boris Johnson said that the same would happen here. But obviously, that never transpired because we went into full lockdown. But on the 11th of March, I would sent something along to Tom at SPIM looking at the impact of gatherings and group sizes. And this was really based on... Um, because I've done my PhD at Warwick, which is where Matt Healing, who's one of the main SPIM modelers, or the original SPIM modelers, he's based... Time. I, I know, I found it online, that picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's one of the main SPIM modelers based at Warwick. I did my PhD at Warwick, and so while I was there, I was aware of this social contact survey that was conducted um, in 2008-2009. Asking everybody about their social contacts and who they speak to in a particular day. And there were quite a few of these surveys at the time, but the key part of this survey is they had this bit at the bottom that says that says um, groups of similar contacts. So people filled in not only their individual social contacts, but they filled in people they met within a group. Um, I don't know if I can see. And you can see some examples of groups. For example, here, this was um, a flight attendant. This triangle in the middle is the person who's filling in the survey. Um, and then these are all their individual contacts that they've reported. And the line between the contacts are when they said those two people know each other as well. And then they've reported these groups of individuals. So this flight attendant obviously was working on a plane and these are groups of similar contacts. Um, there's this person who goes to school, a group of similar contacts of all the people that they meet in school. Uh, I think this one here, that's a church, uh, church going, you get these groups. And the advantage of that key piece of information is that we could really look at what the contribution of these groups was to the overall transmission. Um, so based on all these individual social, social contacts, we were able to construct something that's proportional to an individual reproduction number. So it's something like the number of contacts you have and the length of time you spend with those contacts should be proportional in some way to, um, to the number of secondary cases you'll, you'll generate if you're infected with COVID. Um, the big thing that we didn't know at the time is what this multiplier should be. So we. Uh, this was back in so in March we were just only just really beginning to get those estimates of what the population level reproduction number was and so we didn't really know what this what the overall multiplier should be however we um, Leon and I had done some previous work looking at the attributable fraction due to in for infection in infectious disease models due to different risk factors. And so we essentially use the same methodology that we'd already done, which is essentially, so we'd shown that the attributable fraction is the same as the ratio of reproduction numbers. So because we knew that, we didn't actually need this multiplier and we were able to calculate the attributable fraction due to groups um, 
without actually knowing the magnitude of the reproduction number. Um, and that le led to these, these kind of figures. So here we've got the group size along the horizontal axis and the attributable fraction due to that group of that size up the y-axis. And one of the conclusions that came out of this was that actually these very large groups were having a relatively small impact on overall transmission when, tra when contact patterns remain the same. Um, and then we did some other kind of other analyses looking at the maximum size of group that you could have if you wanted to retain a reproduction number uh, equal to one. So that, that was all fine, but the, the real advantage of that is then because of me working on these reproduction numbers, I was invited uh, via SPIM to contribute to the um, children's, it was called the children's, I don't, we call it Spy Kids, children task and finish group um, on what should happen in schools. So this was in um, April and May 2020. So schools have closed and the questions that were coming to this task and finish group uh, was um, what should what would happen if we reopened schools. And this was chaired by Julia Gogg, who's in Cambridge. And there were a number of different groups contributing to um, to the work that we did. So um, as Tom mentioned, they always like to have a few different models coming up with it. And here you can see the different scenarios that we considered. So for example, like uh, only opening early years, uh, all primary, all secondary, and then a number of different other options like half class, two weeks on, half class, two weeks off, um, kind of part time, and then we've got fully reopened there on the on the right. And um, Bristol and Exeter, we went to Exeter, and we're in, we're in grey there. So you can see that on some things we agreed, and on other things the models didn't quite agree. But it's really kind of pulling apart the different models and why some, why some models thought that something would be more effective than another thing was quite useful in this overall, um, overall um, evidence generation on what might happen when schools reopened. However, while I was um, doing this, one thing became clear that whatever the reproduction, whatever these different strategies we used was kind of irrelevant if you had changing contact patterns and changing behavior in the general population. So um, this was another figure out of this document you can get from that long, um, long web address. And so here I was looking at the proportion of social contacts, so from the social contact survey that were active. So I've got, at the time we were calling it adherence outside the home. So 100% would be where you had no contacts outside of your household and zero would be where you had all your normal contacts. And then looked at these different scenarios of how big the reproduction number would be. So really what we were doing in the previous figure is really just tinkering within these very tiny areas when actually what everybody else was doing outside school was was much more important. Um, so I presented this at SPIM and uh, presenting this at SPIM is a little bit intimidating because there's um, all of uh, the big infectious disease modelers, uh, a huge number of people and observers on the call. And it's a bit like going through extremely rapid peer review. So you get a lot of comments, uh, both after you kind of both during the meeting and then afterwards. And you go through this very rapid process of updating your model, fixing stuff, making, making changes to what you've done. Um, and in particular, Angela McLean, who's one of the, who's the co-chair of SPIRE, she really identified this figure of the changing adherence along with schools reopening <laughs> as something that might be useful for communicating to, um, to ministers and people, non-modelers who might need some communication. So I had um, a lot of uh, backwards and forwards with Angela and with Tom and the other SPIM team about making this figure something that could be used by policy people. So um, firstly, um, 
we reverse the axes. So instead of having this adherence, we abandoned all adherence, um, all notions of adherence. So it's more just um, a kind of descriptive of the proportion of contacts that were active. Um, Angela also thought it was really handy to have kind of sequential ribbons. So rather than having only secondaries open or only primaries open, you could actually think about it as moving between, moving kind of up and between the different ribbons. Um, I added in contact tracing and COVID security, updated what we knew about how children were contributing to transmission. And really importantly, repeat the process with other data sources. So I was just using the social contact survey. So one of the exercises that we did is um, Ed, uh, Edwin von Leeuwen, who had been working a lot on, on Polymod, which was a big social contact survey run out of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And Petra Perpach, who's in Cambridge, she'd been working on the BBC pandemic data. They essentially repeated the analysis um, but with these different data sources and came up with these three, um, three figures that were similar enough for um, it to get spy and approval, if you like, and then carry on making these kind of, making these kind of plots. So these plots were nicknamed ready, the Ready Reckoners or Watermelon Plots or any number of um, different names. And um, just to talk you through them a bit. So on, we've got at the bottom, this is uh, active work and leisure contacts. So those essentially all of, most of your contacts outside of your household. So at absolute zero, there's, we're in full lockdown and you don't speak to anybody outside of your house. And at 100%, you're at normal behavior. And the top of the scale of these figures is determined by what the reproduction number would be in a free flowing, um, unmitigated epidemic so that's what determines what you go up to which at the time was three now is not three unfortunately but uh, at the time was three and then in April 2020 we were in full lockdown we had the schools closed so that's a grey bar and it was estimated through polls and through COMICS which was a social contact survey running every week at the London School um, by John Edmonds and co that about people having about 20% of their usual social contacts. So we were about here. And that gave you a reproduction number of about 0.7, which is approximately right. Um, and so then what you could do is you could kind of chart your chart the way out of lockdown on these um, on these type of figures. So start at position one where we've got lockdowns and and schools closed. You can then open primary schools by moving up to the turquoise bar or partially open. It increases your reproduction number a bit. Uh, you can introduce contact tracing, go to part three. Then we went through a period over the summer where we were easing lockdown. So you increase your proportion of contacts that are active a bit. Um, and then we were thinking, so this was last summer, we were thinking what's going to happen when when the secondary schools reopened in September. And from these kind of analysis, that would give you then a reproduction number that was greater than one at number five. And so you'd really have to, come September 2020, introduce some form of social distancing in order to get the reproduction number down again. Uh, and I spent last summer producing a lot of these kind of figures um, with various amounts of COVID security and various um, amounts of contact tracing um, and I included mass gatherings and variants and uh, vaccination and, and any other kind of variations you can imagine and here's a nice picture that Angela McLean took uh, actually using them and understanding where you might move through these different uh, plots. So my interim conclusions before I hand back to Tom is really that um, one of the, the whole thing of, of scientific advice and spy really evolved, involves a lot of people and uh, it could never be done as an individual working on their own. I mean, it's been, you know, you have continuous feedback. Um, so it's like peer review, but it's like extremely fast peer review where you have to do things 
very quickly and you kind of get real time feedback about the stuff that you're doing. Um, most of the modeling that's been done uh, is based on work that's been done over years and decades. So not exclusively the case, but the vast majority of people who've been doing modeling during COVID were modelers beforehand. And so we're not writing all of these bits of code from scratch and certainly all the social contact surveys and data that are being used, uh, a data that were collected pre pandemic, it would be basically impossible to do everything as soon as a new outbreak started. Um, the one of the things that was key, I mean, we had quite a lot of trouble publishing these ready reckoners, even though people had been using them. And that was really because, well, the landscape had, had moved on, but also things that are relevant for policy are not necessarily the same as academic outputs. And that's not always recognised. So you're not necessarily doing it. So you're going to get a nature paper. You're doing it for other reasons. other, um, And that really makes uh, kind of normal academic metrics um, or keeping up with normal academic metrics can be quite challenging while you're doing all this or while you're doing this other stuff. Um, and that that's my last slide, but I was just going to say um, as part, partly motivated by the fact that no one was fine could get anything published. Uh, we um, put together a special issue in the um, philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. And uh, it included lots of papers that were presented at SPIM that were really useful for policy, but uh, I know about half of them had been reviewed by science and rejected as being too out of date. Um, so anyway, there's lots of, there's 20 articles in there that were all contributed to SPIM by over a hundred mod modelers uh, during that period. That's it, back to you. So just to pick up on the last point, I don't, it's hard to overestimate quite how impactful those ready reckoners were for policy. They completely revolutionized the way that everyone thought about the problem, thought about how to open schools, um, thought about the entire process. And yeah, so it, it's, yeah, the credit should be given, even if uh, that credit isn't a nature paper. Ah, my size went down. So I wanted to briefly talk about what I think makes an academic paper useful for health policy. So I started writing down my thoughts on this, and then I rediscovered a paper from 2015 that was written by the then outgoing chief scientific advisor at the Department for International Development. And I realized that he was he made exactly the same or almost exactly the same points that i had um, come up with which was rather gratifying so i'm just gonna pinch his ideas and tell you how they relate to mine so first one is not actually that relevant so his first point was that you need to make clear which aspect of which policy your paper is addressing um, and in covid land it's always going to be a problem that i have asked them to look into so um kind of moot Secondly, really obvious, you'd think, to be explicit about your methodology, its limitations and its weaknesses. And, you know, you're all good scientists. I know you do these things anyway. But there is a huge appetite from within the machine to really understand exactly what has been done and exactly what the assumptions are. So we've really um, turned around the way that we would write our summaries. You know, at first we would just be very much writing as one would a policy paper with your conclusions at the top and then your assumptions at the end. But we realized that actually, if someone is going to say, to persuade the Chancellor of the Exchequer that your modeling is correct, is, is um, not overly pessimistic, then they need to understand what the assumptions are and they need to, uh, to, to convince him that they are accurate. So we started putting all this stuff right at the top. We started having really open forums within governments where they could be challenged, um, and that w worked really well at getting um, agreement across the piece. Next, um, again, another thing that should be obvious, but attempting to minimise your biases. Um, 
I think Spain were good at this, but it's fair to say that at all ends of the spectrum, you know, whether it's uh, zero COVID, whether it's let it rip terrain, there are scientists in the public eye whose views are very clear before you see their work. And that makes it very hard to interpret with any kind of um, objectivity um, if you think that the authors have come at a particular problem from a particular perspective rather than uh, taking a dispassionate review of the evidence. This I think is quite a challenge. Um, it's always in this world better to have a partially correct answer at the right time than it is a perfectly correct answer too late. Um, an awful lot of my job, as I mentioned earlier, is wrangling timelines, making sure the right thing can be done at the right time to a sufficiently high standard. And um, yeah, it's you can get useful insights from an imperfect piece of work. And if you have different bits of work answering the same problem, those can be a lot more robust, even if they aren't perfect. Another obvious one is to really think about your audience. A lot of the papers I have to read are fairly intelligible to me, to use someone who you know has a degree in infectious, a PhD in infectious disease modeling, has eight years working in policy analysis. And if I can't understand almost all of it on the first go, I know that other people won't, and it just goes nowhere. So yeah, don't pitch your paper at scientists, pitch your paper at the um, intelligent policy um, professional. Number six is another one that isn't really that relevant to us directly. Um, so don't just state what the problem is, but um, also do something about it. I think the closest I can come to is when we get asked things like estimating the effectiveness of the test and trace system. You know, you can do all the modeling alike on that, but it's far better to actually be collecting the data and doing proper empirical analysis on what it's showing. And finally, don't always assume you know what the policy implications are. You know, doing policy is a profession, it is a skill, it is an art, and what the scientists think the policy implications of their work is, is not necessarily actually what the professional would think. Um, I've been a bit cheeky because I haven't actually told you who authored that because um, that um, person went on to do another good job within government um, who you might recognise. Right, I just wanted to finish off with giving myself a bit of retrospective advice so please forgive me if this is a bit a uh, bit too navel gazing but um, I enjoyed thinking about it anyway. So firstly, I, it's really hard to say no. Um, I normally consider my day job to be providing a service and it's kind of like someone working at Starbucks, rejecting your first four orders and having to say yes to the fifth, uh, which was actually the right order all along. Um, but if you don't say no, then nothing will ever get done. Next. I do a lot of stating what you think the obvious is because it became apparent over the course <coughs> of the pandemic that what is obvious to your infectious disease dynamic expert really isn't. So I think everyone in this room will understand what exponential growth looks like, will understand its implications, but that really isn't obvious to most people in the country. Um, so stating not just the first finding, but all the implications of it step by step makes a massive difference. And once you've stated it, state it often, you know, people need to be told something several times before they take it in. And you need to also make sure lots of different people know your results. So you can't, you cannot repeat yourself too many times. You know, the old adage that if you want to persuade a powerful man, and it's almost always a powerful man or something, you have to make them believe they came up with the idea themselves. At the start, we would state things. And as we've 
developed our way of doing things, we realize it's much better to persuade people to come to those conclusions themselves. So laying out the evidence, taking them step by step. We really got caught out by this. As I said, we understand what exponential growth does, but we didn't quite anticipate how horrendous our workload would be. Um, and I wish in mid-February I doubled the size of my team because by the time we got to mid-March, it was too late. You know, you can't train someone up um, overnight. But the flip side of that is that we managed to do far more work than we could possibly have imagined. You know, you can be incredibly productive when you really have to be. And, you know, you're working crazy hours and every weekend you can get a huge amount done, um, admittedly, at a bit of a cost. Number six, repeat yourself often. One of the hardest things for me was losing control. So in my normal day job, I have my team doing the analysis, a policy team who I work with really closely, and I get to shape the questions that we get asked. I get to control the analysis that my team do, and I then get to control the interpretation of those results, you know, make sure they're being uh, understood correctly. And in COVID, none of that was possible. Um, we were getting asked to do things that um, you know, we didn't have a choice over, um, either what the question was or the time scale. It wasn't my team, well, it wasn't the people I employ who were doing the analysis, but basically volunteers who were also having to do stuff like buy toilet paper and homeschool their kids. So I had no control over something being done when I would ask for it, although I should give you know such great credit almost every single time we asked something to be done someone put their head above the power pet and did the work and you know i wasn't the one in the room with boris telling him what the results meant um so i did have no control over the interpretation of the results and yeah that's really hard um especially when you know what the stakes are of things being understood correctly one way around that last problem was to basically become a teacher so I spent quite a lot of last December, January, February, teaching some really senior people within government, basically Epi 101, which was quite a bizarre experience, like spending Monday night doing like a one-to-one -one tutorial. But that has made a massive difference because that meant that our results with their limitations were properly understood and then could be properly explained to the people making the decisions. Don't we I haven't got that many more. Uh, I mentioned earlier, all our stuff gets published. And when Patrick Valance first decided that all the Sage papers would be published, I was had a really, I was terrified, frankly. You know, a lot of the work that had been done hadn't been done with an eye on being published and was open to so, you know, so many potential misinterpretations. But I was totally and utterly wrong. Um, it was one of the very best decisions. Um, you know, you can make all arguments about um, transparency, which are completely valid. But even aside from that, I mean, as I said earlier, having that little, per little person looking over your shoulder, thinking, when I'm writing, thinking, you know, what this is going to be read by Joe Blogs, this is going to be read by the editor of the Daily Mail. What exact is wording should I be using? That really improved the quality of our work as well as the accessibility the openness um, so yeah that was fantastic that that decision was made this one i've not managed to crack but it's really hard having people in the press um throw bricks at you um you know some bricks which were valid some which were not valid um and yeah it's hard not to get that sort of thing personally. And yeah, just finally, I'm keenly aware that there were people, you know, working in hospitals throughout this, you know, people put themselves at personal risk and I absolutely wasn't and, you know, can't compare to that. But there were lots of really horrendously dark days 
and it was really hard for a heck of a lot of people working within government because it was working you know in loads of parts of the country and um, loads of different fields um so understanding that you just have to get through each day and that things change that was really crucial to getting through this and being aware that you are in such a privileged position being able to do the most important job you'll ever do being able to work with you know 50 60 odd professors who are at the peak of their games giving their every hour of, of their lives for this um, was just um, in another way completely fantastic so thank you Thank you very much, um, Tom and Ellen, for a fantastic talk. Um, Ellen, do you want to come up to the talk? Um, so, uh, I might to open the floor to questions. Um, I don't know, I'm not going to be able to see the questions on Zoom, but um, I guess we can start with the questions. Maybe we can see the questions on mm. Zoom. Uh, so, you, um, to start us off with, um, you kind of mentioned a few times about um, people having very strong opinions and um, <coughs> trying to distinguish between, um, I guess, what is an opinion that someone has and potentially even modeling that they come at from a particular angle from kind of, I guess, honest, unbiased modeling. How do you distinguish between those two kind of contributions? And is it to do or is it? Is that uh, open that one to that one first? Well, I, I think the I mean we've mentioned quite a few times having multiple different groups contributing to things that makes a big difference because if I mean everybody has opinions oh you you will have prior beliefs whether you like it or not and it's just really important to have multiple different people doing it so that whatever your preconceptions are, don't end up being the only thing that's, that's considered. That's the only thing I can, that, I mean, what do you think? I think if, yeah, if you have separate views looking at the same thing, that really helps with that. And also, you know, once you've spent a year and a half working with people, you do tend to know what they're going to say quite often. So I think the role of children in, tran in transmission, you know, the role of schools is something where there's been genuine scientific debate you know, throughout the course of the pandemic. And um, if you know that, that someone has previously been expressing this view, then you can take that into account if you interpret um, any work that they've done or any um, yeah, future opinions they give, shall I say. <laughs> In the end though, the model and data should speak for itself rather than, I mean, it's not just people's opinions that go into the smiling yeah, consensus. Ab absolutely, yeah. We're not, make, we're not giving advice based on the opinions. We're giving it very much on the, uh, the modeling and the data. Yeah, I actually found with a lot of the um, analysis that we do, as soon as you start putting something into a model, suddenly you can start to strip away this opinion because that opinion just becomes a parameter and yeah. then you're just debating spreadsheet or a number of R package or whatever. And it's it's kind of harder to um, it's harder to portion primers onto the output level if you're talking about principles that are central to it, which is the PDF. Um, yeah, and if you have your sensitivity analyses, then you know that, say, the role of kids in schools is an important one in that particular policy question and therefore that, that can help shape the policy decisions. I also think the Secretariat did a really fab job communicating uncertainty like I mean there was a lot of discussion because you know we spent a lot of time looking at graphs after half term about numbers of cases going up like uh, and then you can put your opinion in well I definitely think that was that little bump is due to schools um, but you were quite open about putting uncertainties into the consensus statement and that's that's really important as well that that we don't always know. 
yeah and there have been times where i've said you yes. know there is no consensus on this yeah um or use uh numerical probability statements so we have at the end of our papers a like a, a bar saying if i say highly unlikely it means less than 10 percent chance if it means reasonable probability then it means 60 percent chance so using that thinking in that kind of language helps structure your thoughts and is that something that's standard across government using those definitions of it's not something I saw before COVID. It was the Government Office of Science who, when SAGE, were keen on its use, and I think it's been very helpful. Uh, David, then, Jim? Yeah, um, I was just wondering, um, when you were talking about coming back to the issue of having lots of people, lots of groups, it's essentially not the same thing. Is there, is there a distinction between our sort of usual desire to talk to each other <laughs> and the, you know, the kind of we let people talk you know that you gain so much from bouncing ideas off one another um as long as the outputs are coming from you know completely separate bits of code and as long as all the assumptions are clearly laid out so you can tell you know if three different groups have exactly the same assumption about vaccine effectiveness then you know that that's a bit less independent than had you seen a range but it's easy to, so you, you know, people might talk to each other you end up sort of disagreeing about how the treatment was but then you see what happens with these people absolutely and the other thing is have you have you tried to tell a professor what to do <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't stop them if i tried also, I think talking to each other actually led to people doing different methods, like for the R, R values. Um, you know, some people are estimating it by fitting in kind of an exponential curve. Other people are using this kind of instantaneous R number. And I think by speaking <coughs> to people, people had a bit of an oversight and somebody would say, oh, it would be a really good idea to estimate it using some household studies because that's not something anybody else is doing so it kind of it's a bit self-regulating because nobody nobody sets out to just reproduce exactly what somebody else has done um and every everyone thinks that their model's the best one anyway <laughs> yeah i think i think that's what happens i just wondered if um you had a view on whether the way in which um, Klugman responded to the scientific um, knowledge that you were generating changed during COVID, and whether that sort of looks like it, or if it did change, if it's more receptive to the scientific input now, is that something that has, is going to continue to other things beyond COVID? I think I'll say that it evolved over time. And, you know, this was the first time any of those ministers or any of these um, academics or most of those academics were having to face something like this. So in any new situation, how you work together is going to evolve over time. Um, I hope that in the future that those lessons are learnt for, you know, whatever the next thing is, which probably won't be a pandemic, it'll be a I don't know, you can tell me what's going to be the next time, but yeah, I, I do think this is, should be leaving a solid foundation for how science is done and interpreted within government in the future. There is a later question actually from Maria on here. Yeah. Do you want to read it out then? I'll All right. It. Given extensive data collection and modelling, which has taken place during the COVID-19 pandemic, do you think we will be better prepared to produce policy response when the next pan for the next pandemic? like avian flu strikes so we're good to get your views but i think that if this were to happen in the next few years then absolutely yes i think you know there's a huge amount of resource now looking at this and a huge amount of understanding i think the key question mark for me is what happens if this hits in 40 years time you know in 30 years time in 50 years time where we're all long moved out of this world um <laughs> Obviously not this actual yeah. world, but you know, the policy Maybe. world. Well, yeah, uh, probably because of the next pandemic. Um, and yeah, I think that's a really key, a crucial thing is to make sure that whatever 
we come out of this within two, three years time is still constantly renewed for whenever the next pandemic hits. I, think, uh, I mean, the way SPYM has operated and the size of SPYM has changed a lot, hasn't it? And I think that's for the better, I'd say. I mean, not that it was bad to start with, but when I first went along SPYM, the meetings were really quite small um, and there weren't that many people there. But really, the plurality of different groups has been, I mean, one of its strengths. And so I hope that if the new pandemic came about, they would act, they would get everybody to, to join rather than just a couple of people here and there. Yeah, we, we would. Well, I would, if, yeah. I'm, if I'm still in charge, which I really hope I'm not. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm conscious it's past the hour, um, and we have heaps of stuff. Um, so um, all that remains is for me to thank Tom and Ellen for the fantastic talk. Uh, thank you guys for coming to the question. And um, oh, Tom is going to be joining the Future Leaders Forum next. Um, so without further, uh, please do come along. Um, so yeah, if you could join me, thank you, Tom and Ellen. <laughs>